In today's video, we're going to see how the differences in both our genes and our environment can lead to huge variation between different individuals, and how over time, this can lead to the evolution of new species by a process we call natural selection. If you take a look at a group of individuals in a population, you'll notice that they're all different. And in biology, we call this variation, as each individual has different phenotypes. If you remember, a phenotype describes the observable characteristics of an individual due to the interaction of two things, their genes and their environment. Genes code for proteins, and a genome, which is all of your genes combined, codes for an entire organism. Apart from identical twins, everyone in the world has a unique genome which means they have slightly different combinations of proteins inside them, and so they look different. The way we look and function, though, isn't just due to our genes. It's also due to the environment that we're exposed to. For example, a pair of identical twins may have the same genes for being tall, but if one of them didn't eat or sleep as much as the other, then they might not be as tall. Or if one of them spent more time in the sun than the other, then their skin would be darker. The key point to remember with all of this is that most of our characteristics are determined by the interaction of our genes and our environment. In fact, most of our traits are influenced by lots of different genes and lots of different environmental factors. Now, the fact that there are so many different environmental factors kind of makes sense. We all do different things, eat different foods, and so on. But why is there so much genetic variation? Well, the reason there are so many different genes is because of mutations. A mutation is a change in the DNA code so that the protein that it codes for may be different. Keep in mind that most mutations don't actually have any effect on the proteins, and so don't change the organism's phenotype at all. However, in those cases where mutations do change proteins, the phenotype may change slightly. This change will usually be something bad and unwanted, but very occasionally the mutations are beneficial. For example, they could make us more resistant to lung disease, or give us the ability to run faster. Now, as you can imagine, these beneficial mutations mean that those individuals who have them are more likely to survive, and so they're more likely to be able to reproduce and pass on their genes to the next generation. This idea that the fittest individuals are more likely to survive was noticed by Charles Darwin in the 1800s, and he called it survival of the fittest. At the time, he didn't actually know anything about mutations or genes, but he did notice that certain traits were being passed on from parent to child, and that the most useful traits were passed on the most. He called this natural selection, as the fittest individuals were being selected to survive. His most important thought, though, was the concept of evolution, which described how the inheritance of certain characteristics in a population over multiple generations could lead to changes in the whole species, or sometimes even the development of an entirely new species. This means, though, that all current species must have evolved from different species sometime in the past. And if we take it back far enough, we can see that the theory of evolution by natural selection implies that all living species must have evolved from the simple life forms that first developed more than 3 billion years ago. Just like countless other important theories, it took a really long time for Darwin's theory to become properly accepted by the scientific community but it's now been proven multiple times over, from things such as the development of antibiotic resistance in bacteria, where we can literally see evolution taking place, or by looking at fossil records, as we'll see in other videos. So in summary, evolution occurs through natural selection of certain genetic changes that give rise to the phenotypes that are best suited to the environment. And given enough time, the phenotypes of two different populations within a species 
may become so different that they can no longer interbreed to produce fertile offspring, at which point we can say that a new species has been formed. If you haven't heard yet, you can find all of our videos on our website, cognito.org. You'll also find questions, flashcards, exam style questions, and past papers. And we track all of your progress so that you always know what to study next. So sign up for free by clicking here or browse our playlist here on YouTube.